Virgin Most Powerful Radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity. And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. It's that time again. Hi, everybody. Yes, welcome to Hands-On Apologetics, Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo. I'm Gary Machuda, your host and sensei, and uh, just want to welcome everybody. You know, it's time to talk about defending the faith. And, uh, you know, one person that has been so influential with conversions, uh, not only back from the you know early 1900s, but even to today, is a fellow known, known as G.K. Chesterton. Uh, Chesterton has been incredibly influential author, uh, thinker, and um, also, you know, he's kind of blazed his own style of apologetics. So I thought we got to talk about G.K. Chesterton on this show because he's definitely one of those pillars out there that if you aren't familiar with him, you, you ought to be. And who better to talk about G.K. Chesterton than Dale Elquist? So Dale Elquist is going to join us in the dojo uh, later in the program, talk about who G.K. Chesterton was, his conversion to the Catholic faith, his, his apologetics, you know, how how does his apologetics work? And for those who aren't familiar with him, by the way, I also want to tap Dale's mind as far as where should the beginner begin? Because uh, G.K. Chesterton wrote incredible amount of literature, uh, not just nonfiction, but, uh, you know, fiction and all sorts of stuff. But where do we begin? So if you have any questions that you'd like to talk or pose to Dale Elquist, please give us a call at 888-526-2151. That's 888-526-2151. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that segment of the program. We also have our Finding the Fallacy, and the Finding the Fallacy for today is the argument from ignorance. And also the Meet the Early Church Father for today is Isidore of Seville. So uh, a later early church father and uh, very also a very influential figure in church history. Oh, it's time to... Uh, oh, by the way, if anyone has any questions that you would like to send via email, and, uh, you know, the dojo mailbox is open 24-7, uh, just shoot us an email at questions at handsonapologetics.com. Love to see it. Uh, we've had some tremendous questions in the past. And, uh, by the way, if I don't get to your questions, I, I, I try to answer every single one, but... Uh, um, lately I've been kind of bat logged, so don't worry the the mail that's sitting there in the Jojo mailbox, it's there. I just haven't gotten back to you. Uh, please be patient. And perhaps we might even talk about it on the show. We've had some, like I said, some really great questions. Um, and, uh, we, we've actually dedicated a couple of shows to them. So please keep them coming. And it's time for us to give our shout outs to those watching live stream on Facebook and YouTube. Hello, everybody. Great to see everybody. Ah, uh, yes, the emojis are out. <laughs> and uh, by the way, for those who watch on live stream, if I turn my head this way, I'm not ignoring you. I'm actually looking at the chat room on YouTube. Now, fortunately, I don't have anything for Facebook. So, unfortunately, the Facebook people are in the dark. But nevertheless, I do appreciate you watching live stream on Facebook anyway. Okay, so why don't, without further ado, why don't we jump into our exercises for today? And as I said, they're finding the fallacy. Each each show we try to grab a uh, informal logical fallacy. On Fridays, usually it's a propaganda technique, and uh, to kind of uh, look at some how bad thinking is out there, so you can recognize it, detect it, and hopefully clarify it for people. And today's finding the fallacy is the argument from ignorance, and it, it's not basically just arguing from things you don't know. Okay, there, there's a bit of us more structured than that. It's not just an ignorant person who argues commits the argument from ignorance. But rather it's this. It's when something is said to be true because it has not yet been proven false. Okay, so it's kind of like using one's inability to uh, falsify something as proof that something is true. Uh, let me give you some examples. 
like I said, usually with finding the fallacy, uh, the examples are a lot more clear than the definition. Uh, for example, someone could say, we've proved that the moon is not made of cheese, but we haven't proved that its core is not made of cheese. So therefore, you know, this moon cheese theory still stands, right? So it's a, in a sense, you know, since we haven't proven the opposite, you know, the other, the, uh, the thing that hasn't been true, proven is true, okay? Um, so it says that something's true because we haven't been pro able to prove it false, okay? Um, here's another one. This is a classic, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a research nerd, and, uh, and sometimes I do nerdy things, even though I don't know if I'd call myself, qualify myself as a nerd. But uh, remember Plan 9 from Outer Space? That's usually voted as one of the worst movies ever made. Um, there is a line at the end of it where it commits the argument for ignorance. And for some reason, it just always stuck in my head. So whenever I see this fallacy, I think of Plan 9 from Outer Space. And it's, it's Criswell. You know, he gives these this closing dialogue after this real stinker of a movie. And he says, my friend, you have seen this incident based on sworn testimony. Can you prove it didn't happen? Okay, well, <laughs> sure. <laughs> you can't prove it didn't happen, but, you, but that doesn't mean it did happen, right? So that's the argument from ignorance. All right, let's jump to the Meet the Early Church Father for today, who is St. Isidore of Seville who was born roughly about 560, died 636. Um, Isidore was, was born in Seville, and his family uh, come there a number of years earlier uh, from uh, Carthagena. Uh, Isidore was quite young when his father died, and he was raised by his brother and sister, uh, who were much older than him, and his brother uh, Fulgentius. Later, he was educated in a monastic institution in Seville, and afterwards entered the religious life there. Now, Fulgentius uh, became Bishop of Carthagena, and his other brother became Archbishop of Seville. Um, let's see, he's also, uh, his name is Leander. He also became known as the Apostle to the Visigoths, Leander. Um, in 599, 600 AD, uh, Leander died, and Isidore succeeded his own brother as Metropolitan of Seville. From that time until his death, 36 years later, Isidore was one of the most powerful persons in Spain. He presided over numerous councils and synagogues, including a very important church council, <coughs> excuse me, known as the Fourth Council of Toledo in 633. And uh, this first national council of Toledo, that's not Toledo, Ohio, folks, this is Toledo, Spain, stressed the obligation of clerical celibacy, uh, declared that the clergy is exempt from taxation and from certain feudal obligations, and decreed the establishment of a college in each diocese for the training of clergy. Thus anticipating what was established by the Council of Trent, namely 900 years later, about establishing seminaries. Because up until then, if you wanted to become a priest, you basically would find a good holy priest and, and study under him and then later be uh, presented to the bishop to be ordained, uh, which was good, but it wasn't perfect. And, of course, if you're studying under a priest who's not very well educated, yeah, you know, the finishing product isn't very good. So actually, uh, under Isidore of Seville, he actually anticipates a reform that would happen 900 years later at the Council of Trent. In his own time, he was extraordinarily... Uh, uh, important person in terms of administrative capacity and fostering education. He was an enormous influence in the Middle Ages through his writings, especially uh, by reason of his work called uh, Origins or uh, Etymologies. Excuse me, Etymologies. Uh, he wasn't super original as a writer. However, uh, he was incredibly learned and was broadly educated. So it, it was a great person in a sense to write a textbook. Okay, um, he was, uh, uh, let's see, in, in 653 AD, uh, the Eighth Council of Toledo declared him a doctor of the church, and he's honored in Seville for 1100 years before Pope Innocent XIII declared him a doctor of the universal church in 1722. Uh, like I said, Isidore's writings 
uh, is numerous. I mean, it's basically an encyclopedia of uh, writings. In the Middle Ages, by the way, anyone who was unfamiliar with Isidore probably would be considered to be not very well educated. So he, he really becomes a staple of medieval education and, uh, you know, if he, a touchstone for anyone who knows anything. Unfortunately, uh, today, and this is from Jurgen's uh, Faith of Early Fathers, he notes that today, unfortunately, uh, Isidore is almost entirely neglected, you know, where before he was a staple of education in the Middle Ages. Now, very few people know of his work or read his works, but you can read his works. They are available. And, uh, you know, I should also note this. One of my favorite resources, by the way, if you ever hear on this program a early church father that you would love to read some of the writings, a lot of them are available for free in English on the web. Uh, there's a number of sites who give it. One of my favorites is uh, newadvent.org. That's one of my favorite spots to, uh, to get there. And, by the way, you can just scroll down, choose Isidore, and uh, click on one of his writings and go ahead. Become educated become literate <laughs> and not only him but all the early church fathers too so that's my little tip along with the meet the early church father i suppose i should probably finish by saying that isidore died in 636 a.d and uh by the way he also is usually accounted as the last of the early church fathers in the west okay saint, saint john J damascene or saint john of damascus is usually the last of the early church fathers in the east isidore sabel is the last of the west all right folks that's our sessions for today coming up on the other side of the break we're going to be talking to dale elquist about gk chesterton you don't want to miss it folks stay tuned This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%! Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. 
Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody. Uh, one of the most influential literary figures out there uh, for uh, defending, explaining the faith, uh, just learning the faith, just introducing people to common sense uh, remains in uh, Gilbert Keith Chesterton, otherwise known as G.K. Chesterton. And uh, joining us today, we have uh, a person who I think is incredibly well suited to work us through the incredible thought of G.K. Chesterton. Dale Elquist. Dale Elquist is the president of the Society of Gilbert Keith Chesterton. He's also the publisher of Gilbert Magazine and the creator and host of the popular EWTN series, The Apostle of Common Sense. Dale has written five books on Chesterton, including Common Sense 101, Lessons from G.K. Chesterton, and The Complete Thinker. He's also the co-founder of Chesterton Academy, a classical high school in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, which has been rated uh, one of the top 50 Catholic high schools in the nation. He's also the chairman of the Chesterman School uh, Network, which now has 15 high schools in the U.S., Canada, and Italy. He and his uh, wife, Laura, live in Minneapolis with ch six children. Dale Elquist, welcome to Hands-On Apologetics. Thank you, Gary. God bless you. Oh, I, no, thank you so much for coming. You have been on my wish list for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, uh, G.K. Chesterton, I, I have to confess, I really, I, I've read some things of his, but I, I never got a, like a full grasp of him as a person and his writings, and I figured you, more than anybody, can help walk us through that. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, G.K. Chesterton's life? He's a, uh, a writer from the early 20th century, so he died in 1936 and did all of his uh, his published writings were in the uh, first third of the century, and during that time, Gary was one of the most prolific writers who ever lived, which is yeah. probably why you and a lot of other people haven't ever gotten a grasp of him because he's so amazingly prolific. That's true. But he uh, he yeah, just he cranked out a uh, hundred books and uh, thousands of newspaper essays and hundreds and hundreds of poems, and wrote some very famous uh, detective stories featuring a priest named Father Brown. And uh, some amazing works on uh, just intellectually uh, profound works as well as uh, wonderful epic poems. And kind of shocked the world in 1922 as when this very world-famous, world-renowned writer announced that he had been received into the Catholic Church. Yeah. Now, what was he before that? Was he Anglican or was he an atheist? Or... Yeah, he, he worked his way up to uh, becoming Anglican, his... Uh, he so he came from a very non-denominational, non-creedal background, basically a Unitarian as as he was raised as a child, and uh, okay. became a Christian. Joined the uh, Church of England right at the turn of the century when he married his wife Frances, and uh, and then uh, that was the beginning of a of a very steady and deliberate trek towards Rome. Now, most of his writings was there one period where he wrote the most. I'm just curious. Yeah, all of it. <laughs> 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 yeah, I figured with that many works. Yeah, so they're they're honestly uh, he, he just he just was so amazingly prolific. He you know two three books a year would come out from this guy, as well as uh, daily and weekly essays in major newspapers, as well as po uh, you know poems and and short stories. So it's it's just it's just a really mind boggling literary output put that he had. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Um, so. Uh, so he, he was a uh, very nominal Protestant, uh, like Unitarian. Uh, you know, he, um, you know, he became Christian. Uh, like, what were some of the seminal things that that you know propelled him from a non-believer to a believer? Um, what, what is there any yeah, particular that ideas story, that hit him? Yeah, sure. That that story is told in his book Orthodoxy, which was written in 1908, which many people. Um, consider a very Catholic book. In fact, the book has been published, uh, you know, reprinted by many Catholic uh, publishers as a great defense of the Catholic Church, and yet he he wasn't really quite Catholic when he wrote it, although you, you can't really find anything in it um, that contradicts uh, a Catholic understanding of, of Christianity. We, he always refers to the Church with a capital C, and uh, the historic Church, and so he was really already of the mindset there, you know, kind of thinking like an Anglo-Catholic that the 
Anglican Church was also part of the uh, Apostolic uh, Church, you know, because he uh, embraced the Apostles' Creed. Mm-hmm. So it was a, an understanding of a, of a historic church that he that he embraced, and uh, it just gets into how he defended the faith, um, because he basically came at it from all sides, and, and that's how he uh, that's how he arrives at, at Christianity. But he he has this great line where he says that. It, it was the arguments against Christianity that convinced him it was true. Huh. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, so it that was because of the other failure, the or it was because yeah. they pointed at no. some truth? No, be, be, well, because he, he always, he, it, it, he saw that all of these arguments against Christianity were um, insufficient arguments and also okay. contradictory arguments. Um, People would say, uh, you know, the, the the church is is too fancy, too elaborate, too rich, and then people would criticize the church for being too poor, too plain, too ascetic, and uh, you know, the, the church would emphasize uh, uh, fruitfulness and babies on the one hand, and celibacy uh, on the other, and uh, you know, he saw all these that the, the church was. Uh, criticized for contradictory things, and he said, "Well, maybe it's the church that's right, and all the criticisms that are wrong." Okay, yeah. So it, uh, it you know, that brings us to Chesterton's paradoxes. You know, the, mm-hmm. it seems he, he really loves this paradoxical truth. Yeah, he's a master of the paradox, or like they, even during his own time, they call him the Prince of Paradox. Um, <laughs> Whereas Chesterton maintained that his so-called paradoxes were only simple, basic truths that everyone had forgotten, and they sound so astonishing and uh, unexpected because we're we're not used to hearing uh, the plain truth spoken. But truth does tend to go against our expectations, and uh, Chesterton has a good, you know, he has a good model to follow for for paradox because. He believes in that book that says the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And uh, if you want to save your life, you have to lose it. And uh, a virgin shall give birth and the dead shall rise. Th- those are all paradoxes. Yeah. And so Chesterton is in good company when he says that, you know, the self is more distant than any star and the worship of health is unhealthy and the worship of nature is unnatural. <laughs> 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 no, did he did he have this sense of paradox before he became a believer, or was that something that he kind of uh, uh, clinged to once he became a believer? I I would say that his sense of paradox helped propel him to become a, a believer. That you know he understood that there is this apparently contradictory nature to the truth that that um, there is this this contradiction or this apparent contradiction at the heart of existence. And he said the the church is the only philosophy that that really embraces that idea because it is centered around the the greatest of all paradoxes um, a a person who is fully God and fully man at the same time. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. So, okay, so uh, now uh, so he's Anglican in England. You know, he's, I imagine, a very well-respected, at least very well-known writer and thinker in England. What what made him choose Catholicism? Because wouldn't that kind of make him a pariah in, you know, in the eyes of English people? Yeah, yeah. Ta- yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's that was kind of the, the genius of, of the creation of the Father Brown character, because um, he knew that a Catholic priest was someone that was going to be ignored or not taken seriously, and so, as a fictional character, uh, being the one who is is the only one in the room who can figure out uh, the crime, <laughs> yeah, uh, make, you know, it's just it's just a wonderful um, uh, literary device because what Chesterton did was he created the underdog detective, uh, you know, mm. kind of the antithesis of Sherlock Holmes, and uh, and so yes, Catholic Catholics and Catholic priests were were pretty low on the. Uh, on the totem pole of, in, in terms of the literary and intellectual circles. And, uh, and Chester not only knew a priest that was, you know, what he, he thought a, really a, a, a intellectual giant, but also he realized that the historic church had a lot more going for it 
than all of the recent sects that had broken away from it. So, yeah, he did go against the grain. Uh, in fact, one of his great lines, you know, a dead thing can go with the stream, only a living thing can go against it. And uh, <laughs> and, and he was the, the living thing going against the stream by becoming Catholic. Yeah, what was it that impelled him to Catholicism? Uh, was there um, a particular thought or person or idea or... Sure. Yeah. He, you know, he's, he's one, it's a, it was a long, steady and very deliberate conversion. Um, you know, and that, that's why orthodoxy seems like he's defending the, the Catholic church, even though he's, um, still not yet technically Catholic, but yeah. it, it really is a conversion of the truth. Or let's say, let, let's say a, um, um, everything, con- a convergence of the truth rather. Okay. That e- everything, pointed to it and that's why uh that's why he 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 finally accepted it that, that that there were no more he had no more objections left to the to the catholic church it continued to be right on every count and uh he, he found it to be the thing that was right when everything else was wrong okay. the uh the incident that really propelled it was well, I mean, there's two things you know one what gary people asked him why did you become catholic he said to get rid of my sins Hmm. Only the Catholic Church can do that. So it was an embracing of the um, the sacrament of confession. But also, it, there was a there was that one thing that separates the Catholic Church from all the other churches, and that was um, the Virgin Mary. And uh, Chesterton really always had a, a devotion to the Virgin Mary, but and and never had any of the Protestant objections to Mary. But he realized that the Catholic Church was the only thing, you know, the only church that really had that veneration of the Mother of God, and of course, could there be a greater paradox than Mother of God? Um, yeah. And and so it was. He was returning from a trip to the Holy Land, um, and he walked into a Catholic church in a port town in uh, in Italy, in Brindisi. He just walked in and saw a statue of the Virgin Mary, and that's when he realized when he got back to England, he had to finish. Finished the journey he'd started, and he had to uh, had to had to become a Catholic. Wow, wow! I never knew that. That's that's fascinating. Yeah. Well, we're uh, just coming up on the break. Um, perhaps on the other side of the break, uh, yeah. Why don't we talk a little bit more about uh, G.K. Chesterton's uh, um, you know prowess as an apologist, and maybe we can go through some books that absolutely every Catholic needs to read before they die. Okay, does that sound? <laughs> All right. All right. Well, great. We were talking with Dale Elquist about the great G.K. Chesterton, the apologist, and uh, lots of great stuff coming up on the other side of the break, folks. You listen to Hands On Apologetics. Stay tuned. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support 
because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. We are chatting with Dale Elquist about G.K. Chesterton, the apologist. And uh, Dale just gave us a a brief outline of his own uh, G.K. Chesterton's uh, conversion to Christianity and ultimately to the Catholic faith. And Dale, you know, I realize that I'm a mess here. Usually I ask my guests to give a little, a little bit of a story of themselves about, you know, their, their journey of faith. And I always wanted to ask you, what was it that uh, attracted you to, you know, studying and basically dedicating your career to propagating G.K. Chesterton's works? Well, Gary, my story is not interesting, but uh, <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I, was I would a, say uh, that I was a Baptist. <laughs> yeah, I was a Baptist um, evangelical um, and a big C.S. Lewis fan, as so many evangelicals are and and should uh-huh. be. And uh, it was basically uh, someone pointing out to me that the the, the real force behind C.S. Lewis was G.K. Chesterton. Um, in fact, he made the uh, rather outrageous comment. If you read Chesterton, you don't need to read C.S. Lewis because all of C.S. Lewis is in Chesterton, and I, I consider that a blasphemous remark. But I, uh, <laughs> I tucked that away. That seed that was planted, and it was about three years before I picked up my first Chesterton book, and I realized, uh, yeah, this guy's even better than C.S. Lewis, and uh, I wow. just never, never went back after that. And it was uh, an interest that became a passion, and then just took over my life. Could, couldn't get enough of Chesterton because he. He seemed to write and and uh, shed light on anything, any topic that he touched, and uh, truly a complete thinker. And then the, yeah. he was at the same time doing a number on me, and I found my way to the Catholic Church really as a result of his influence. You know, I I imagine as a Baptist, uh, the thought of G.K. Chesterton in some ways, like you know, it has that familiarity through C.S. Lewis, but he also. Um, there was, it must have been also kind of foreign too. There's foreign elements to his writing, uh, given your background. Yeah, well, you know, I think he I think he strikes everybody as different from anything else they've ever read. <laughs> Chesterton That's true. is completely unique, and he he takes you on a new journey. And uh, if even if you're uh, a cradle Catholic, you'll find he's coming at a, at a different angle than a traditional Catholic writer because he himself. Uh, came in as an outsider, being a convert himself, and so yeah. he's always t- takes an unusual angle, but it's always a fuller and and more uh, complete picture than than what you expected. So he's anything but narrow. Yeah, that's true. And in some ways, isn't it? Uh, that's one of his appeals: is that he touches on so many subjects, you know, and ties it all to to our faith that. Uh, somebody might be interested in political theory, and they'll run across Chesterton, and they'd be brought to the same, you know, point as, like for you, a Baptist who reads them and and is drawn into the faith. Absolutely, he. Uh, they may come for him for his literary criticism because he, he he writes so much about English literature, and if they read his books, for instance, on Charles Dickens, they're going to be swept away by the the light that he sheds on on that great writer. And then they say, okay, well, I want to read what else this guy has to say. And, and then they, they find themselves being exposed to, to things that they uh, had never considered that they would, that they would want to investigate. Uh, yeah. uh, detective fiction, of course, is another thing. You know, people who aren't Catholic love his detective fiction because it's just great detective fiction. But it's also every, every one of his, uh, 
you know, Father Brown stories is a little homily as well. So <laughs> that's true. I, so the sheer breadth of his writing, you know, is uh, pulls people in. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, he's such a unique writer. Uh, did he have any influences? I mean, was is there some reason why he's so unique? Well, I mean, I think we have to acknowledge Gary that. He he was uh, a genius. He was gifted, yes. just like Mozart or Bach uh, had had a, a gift from God. Uh, so it was clearly uh, something that he used for the glory of God, his creativity and his his amazing mind. But yeah, he filled his his mind with good things uh, growing up because he um, was immersed in English literature, and uh, so. It, you know, he writes well on Dickens because he read all of Dickens. He writes well on Shakespeare uh, because he, he read Shakespeare. And it was really the, the great, the giants of English literature that probably influenced him more than anything else. Um, and, uh, and and so he was able to carve a very good philosophy out of, out of great English literature. Yeah. Yeah, now with every great fig- figure, there's always a nemesis, you know, a thorn in the side. Did he have an arch nemesis that, uh, you know, was his arch enemy from a opposing point of view? Or, uh... Yeah, that's a great story. I'm glad you brought that up because the fact is uh, Chester made friends with all his enemies. Um, <laughs> his philosophical opponents be- became close personal friends. Even though they would argue, they'd have yeah. great public debates. They uh, Chesterton was so um, engaging and kind and amicable that they couldn't help but like him. And so um, <laughs> people like George Bernard Shaw and H.G. Wells, who are thinkers diametrically opposed to G.K. Chesterton, uh, were charmed and won over by the man himself. And uh, they, they became very good friends. Chesterton was known as the, as the man with no enemies because he would only argue about arguments and not... not take personal assaults uh, against people yeah yeah and that's a mark of a great apologist too because uh, i mean one Amen. of my favorites is uh, sir arnold lunt and uh yeah he he loved debates and he uh, there is one account where he said that he hammered this guy mercilessly in the written debate but met him at for tennis and they were best of chums you know it was he argued about arguments like you said yeah, you know, here's a good, good Arnold Lund story. I'm glad you brought up Arnold Lund. He he wrote a book called Roman Converts. Um, w- uh, you know, sort of against the Roman Catholic Church. Be- this is before his own conversion, mm-hmm. uh, and and he has a whole chapter uh, dedicated to Chesterton and trying to pick apart his uh, defenses of the Catholic faith. <laughs> Chesterton responded with an extended uh, article uh, in the Dublin Review, and. Um, Arnold Lund, of course, subsequently did become Catholic and subsequently became friends with Chesterton, uh, <laughs> and, and and of course a defender of Chesterton's ideas. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful! I didn't know that. Yeah, I'll have yeah. to look it up. It was. Uh, yep. So, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. That's it. I, that was that was the thoughts right there. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, uh, is there now? Is there a cause for G.K. Chesterton be considered a, a for sainthood? Uh, do you know about that? There, there, yeah, there's a movement for a cause where the uh, Chesterton Society that, that I that I run is very active in promoting uh, his the opening of his cause. It's still not opened. Uh, there's there's been an investigation stage, and uh, we are hoping that uh, it'll it'll lead to the cause being officially open soon. Uh, there's a certainly a great devotion to Chesterton, and uh, we're we're we've passed out a lot of prayer cards asking for his intercession. People. Um, People are drawn to his goodness, and and we we need more lay saints. We need especially bottles of lay spirituality uh, for our time. I think Chesterton really fits the bill well. Amen, amen. Yeah, but I can imagine, you know, th- that will be a chore going through all his writings, you know, <laughs> to a- yeah. to analyze yeah, it I, for sainthood. I think one of the advantages that he will have uh, is the same that Cardinal Newman had, uh, is that they only have to. Re- uh, consider his writings after his conversion, because uh, okay. what he wrote before his conversion can't really be held against him uh, because he wasn't Catholic. So. That's true. I didn't know that. That that makes perfect sense. Okay, so well, there's a good chance he could be canonized before the second coming, then. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Boy, if they had to go yeah. through all his works. <laughs> Uh, I've been I've been reading his stuff for uh, about thirty seven years, and I we're still finding new things that he wrote that we didn't know about. It's just an incredible. Uh, it b- blows your mind how much he wrote. Yeah, indeed, indeed, and uh, yeah, so incredible uh, mark of uh, charity. I mean, uh, even it, like you said, even his most bitter enemies be, uh, looked at him with fondness. Yes. N- yes. Now, was he part of the Inklings? No, he would be before okay. the Inklings. Um, he's he's about twenty five years older than uh, C. S. Lewis and Tolkien at at all, and uh, okay. they were very influenced by him. Uh, they read his writings, but they probably most of them never met him. Tolkien and C. S. Lewis never met him. Charles Williams may have met him. Okay, yeah, but they certainly. Uh... Yeah, they knew about his writings. I mean, I imagine there's a oh, huge yeah, very, body of... Oh, yeah, he was... He, yeah. And and Lewis demonstrates that very clearly. I mean, Lewis's main arguments from mere Christianity are all lifted from The Everlasting Man by, by Chesterton. Wow. No, I didn't know that. Oh, that's fascinating. So if you want to read mere Christianity, you should read Everlasting Man first. Yeah, and then just keep reading Chesterton after that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh yeah we have maybe a couple of minutes now uh one reason why he has so many writings uh, he wrote a, a column in the newspaper right he was a columnist yes uh that's you know one of the reasons why he was so popular i mean he, he wrote a lot of books but he was known for his newspaper columns which is why people knew him um in fact, it's one of the reasons why people stopped knowing him so much after his death because he stopped writing for the newspaper when he died, you know. And, uh, oh. and so, so it was his daily uh, articles, which were on all different subjects all across the the spectrum, in which he would defend Christianity, even though he wrote for secular uh, newspapers. He he always pointed to God. Always there was always an eternal reference point. And, Said, you know that the the modern world's main problem is that it's it's, it's a religious problem, as it, it's a mental problem as well as a moral problem, and uh, we we've forgotten God, and uh, you know we for, we forgot that the, the truth that the church teaches, and the the more that we wander from them, the the more messed up the world gets, and that that's kind of an ongoing theme. Interesting, yeah. So even in a secular newspaper, you know, it's yep. Ultimately, it comes back to you know. The, the ultimate first principle, God. Yep. Yeah, very good. Okay. Yeah, he, Go ahead. Well, he also you know, put together faith and reason so well. That's why he's so, uh, you know, he was able to, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't even have to uh, uh, overtly talk about God, but, but, he, but he implies, that, you know, that's, that's the thing that's missing. So he, he could do it both ways by pointing directly to the truth of the Catholic Church or just implying this is where it's at. So he's very genius in his argument. Yes, very good. Well, we're talking to Dale Elquist about Ch- Ch- Chesterton. Stay tuned, everybody. We'll be right back after this break. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. 
We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%! Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody. We're talking with Dale Elquist about G.K. Chesterton. And before I go to book recommends, like I've been promising, um, you know, Dale, it occurred to me during the break that Chesterton lived into the mid-1930s. Are there any audio recordings of him? Yeah, there's uh, three audio recordings uh, of his voice. He he did a a BBC radio broadcast um, on a fortnightly basis in the 1930s, and uh, in fact, people bought radios just so they could hear Chesterton's voice. <laughs> and uh, th- those were uh, those were all uh, book reviews, so they're all literary nature. And uh, we have uh, we have two of those that were preserved, and then he also gave an after-dinner uh, talk, um, and uh, we have that one as well. So those are the those are the three recordings of his voice that we have. Okay. Now, tell the truth. After hearing his voice, when you read his works, do you hear his voice in your head? Well, you know, I, I felt like I heard his voice before I actually <laughs> heard his voice, because there's just there's something about the, the geniality uh, in it, uh, and yeah. the humility in it. I, I think the thing that was added uh, is the fact that he would he would chuckle at his own jokes a little bit, and, and so he just his his good natured quality just comes out in in those recordings. Oh, that's awesome! Okay, well, uh, let's go to book recommends because you know his works better than anybody you know on the planet, I imagine. So, <laughs> <laughs> where would uh, a beginner who has never read Chesterton before where's the best place to start? Well, okay, now okay. Uh, this, this answer I'm going to give you is going to sound a little uh, little weird and a little self-serving, but I, I always recommend people start with one of the books that I wrote uh, okay. about Chesterton because they, they really provide good introductions. Uh, and one of those is The Apostle of Common Sense, which is just a, an overview of his most important writings. And then another one is called Common Sense 101, Lessons from Chesterton. And that takes him by his main themes and Really, all I do is quote Chesterton in, in the book, so I don't really do much writing at all. It's, it's all Chesterton uh, arranged uh, by me and, and me dodging between the Chesterton quotations. Uh, and I just came out with a new book called Night of the Holy Ghost, which is a, a, a biography of, of Chesterton and um, a look into his writings and, and a, uh, making a case for his sainthood as well. So now after those, uh, any of those three are good introductions, uh, the, the book to the, the, there's kind of four main books that one should read by Chesterton, uh, and then there's probably four more after. The, but or, Orthodoxy and the Everlasting Man are the his great defenses of the faith. Uh, his book on Saint Francis of Assisi and Saint Thomas Aquinas uh, are just wonderful treatments of those not only of those saints but of of mysticism and uh, scholasticism. I mean the two. The two uh, elements of the faith, the, the mystical element and the intellectual element of the faith, so really great combinations. Uh, and then uh, I, I recommend, obviously, the Father Brown stories are a great delight. Any book of his essays is uh, is going to be a real treat. Uh, and and then um, I think I referred to his book on Charles Dickens before. Uh, that's one of those things where you just can't go wrong. It's It, it will just astonish you. But then his, one of his novels uh, is called Man Alive. Uh, and one, uh, the man who was Thursday. Those are those are just terrific novels as well. 
Okay. Yeah. It's like, where do you start? You know, <laughs> that's why I, I, I think, you know, it, I think you're absolutely right that the beginner should go to uh, like a compendium or an introduction first, because he's written on so many different things in so many different uh, genres. Uh, uh, so uh, let's see, The Apostle of Common Sense, who's the publisher for that? Well, was a, that's an Ignatius book. Uh, in fact, Ignatius okay. published uh, all three of those first ones I mentioned, the, uh, the Apostle, Common Sense, Common Sense 101, and Night of the Holy Ghost. Those are all by Ignatius. Okay, very good. You can good. also go to our, our webpage, uh, Gary, which is chesterton.org, and uh, the books are all available there, as well as you know, a bunch of Chesterton's writings. And if anyone is interested in taking it a step further, uh, the, the uh, Chesterton Society publishes a magazine, Gilbert Magazine, which is... Uh, a great uh, collection of, uh, you know, not only showing how contemporary his commentary is, but talks about some of the ministries that that we uh, are involved in, which includes classical education. Very good. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, Gilbert, uh, it, it is uh, uh, obviously you know it, you have his works and so on, and then you talk about uh, G.K. Chesterton and contemporary uh, issues. And then, yeah, I mean, what, was that so prophetic, thing? and so yeah, we basically, you know, have a running commentary on today's world from G.K. Chester because he's so prophetic. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, you, know, uh, yeah, so definitely stop there. So I'm sorry. Could you give that website again, just in case people didn't? Yes, that? absolutely. It's Chesterton dot org o r g. If they go to Chesterton dot com, Gary, they'll get hydraulic valves. <laughs> that may, you know, that might be what they want, but that's not going to get them the, the writings by G.K. Chesterton. So, Chesterton.org. Yeah, very good. Chesterton.org. Yeah, check it out, everybody. Uh, because, yeah, I, you really do need a roadmap for Chesterton. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because uh, you crack open, like, an Ignatius Press catalog and turn to the Chesterton sections, you know, of multiple pages <laughs> you could really get lost so yeah very good you know dale if you could go back in a time machine and, and meet chesterton w what questions would you ask him yeah you know, that's a fun question in the in that i feel like he's already answered all the questions that i've had to ask um yeah, because i've i've had the great privilege of reading him uh you know yeah. for over 30 years and he he comes up with things that I say, oh yeah, I was wondering what he thought about that. He, there it is. He tells me. Um, so the, the great, it's it's one of the things that also convinces me that he's a saint, that he's, cause he's so present. Uh, yeah, I really feel a part of the community of saints. He's become, you know, a, a living friend of mine, and uh, that's what a saint is. Um, yeah. And so I, I, it's just, it's, I've never really had the, uh, I, I really feel like I haven't missed anything by not, having been with him during his lifetime because i feel like i'm i'm with him right now yeah yeah no you're absolutely right because you know it's just as god is the answer to all questions you know it's like uh, a saint should radiate that that uh you know the different mm -hmm. parts of their life no matter how you approach them ultimately should lead you to god that's a that's a really profound insight yeah uh you're here one question i would have it's <laughs> pretty <laughs> yeah. mundane. Question, it, Gary. Yeah. Maybe you can answer this. Is why, I, from what I understand, he had a cane that was also a sword, right? <laughs> or is that a myth? Yeah, he would, he, yeah, he would call it a walking stick, which is different from a cane. Okay, a walking stick is sort of an, or, an ornament that a gentleman carries with him and uses it as a prop and points to things with it. And uh, there was a time when he was a younger man that he also, uh, his walking stick was also a sword stick. There was a concealed sword inside of it. <laughs> and uh, I think it was part of his romantic nature. Uh, he never, uh, I think he was, he was, uh, there was part of him that always was the knight and always the chivalrous one, uh, yeah. ready to defend a woman in a duel and, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and, and strike out against his enemies. The only thing he ever stabbed with his sword was the, the pillows in his study when he was uh, dictating uh, an essay to his secretary or something. So. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a beautiful thing about him because, uh, you know, in some ways, uh, just in terms of appearance, he's something of a paradox. You know, he's the chivalrous knight, yet he had some girth, you know, and I can relate yeah, to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, he, he was very, he, people were struck by his great size because he, he was not only uh, rotund, but he was tall too, which was, 
you know, when he walked through the room, he just, everybody looked up because he, he filled up the room and, and he was always joking about his size. He was, uh, he said, I'm the politest man in all, in all of England because I could stand up on a bus and offer my seat to three women at one time. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I can relate. I'm six foot eight. So, uh, you know. <laughs> oh, God I, bless I, you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> So you, I, mean, uh, you would have had the, I mean, the effect that you have on people would be the same that he would have, because you know, it, it, relatively speaking, a, a six foot four guy like he was uh, would have had that same effect uh, walking yeah. into the room. Yeah. yeah. So, so he would stick out in a crowd, just like his yeah, writings. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, yeah. There's a great story of a lady coming up to him on the street saying, "Everybody seems to know you, Miss, Mr. Chesterton," and he, and he sighed and says, "Yes." And if they don't, they ask. <laughs> 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 yeah what a great uh yeah that's yeah and you know he's one of those people too that if you picked up one of his works and you know didn't pay attention to the title page and just start reading it you'd immediately know it's him you know mm -hmm. it's so distinctive of a writer and a thinker uh that uh it's like f fingerprints you just know it's him yeah very much so but the other thing that the first time reader is going to uh, do when they're reading him is, is go back and f try to figure out when it was written because he, it is amazing how he seems to be writing for the time we live in, even though he wrote a hundred years ago. Yeah, yeah. Still, well, you know, that's truth is timeless. You know, it's uh, amen. It, it's applicable in the first century. It's applicable now. It's applicable millennia from now. All right. So, man, I can't believe that our time has flown like this. Um, <laughs> be before I let you go, once again. Uh, if you could give the names of your books and also the website. Yeah, um, the uh, the Apostle of Common Sense uh, and Common Sense 101 are great introductions to Chesterton. Uh, it just came out with a new biography called Night of the Holy Ghost. And I should mention one other book, too, um, Gary, also just came out called My Name is Lazarus. And it's 34 stories of uh, converts who... Uh, whose path to Rome was paved by G.K. Chester. People who read Chester Wonderful. found the Catholic Church in all different backgrounds, and just, just a delightful book. Uh, and then uh, they can find all these books at chesterton.org. My name is Lazarus. I'm definitely picking that up. That sounds awesome. Great. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, uh, chesterton.org, right? Not the yeah. uh, hydraulic thing. <laughs> all right. Hydraulic well, thank you, Dale. Thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. Have a blessed live. God bless. Thank you. You too. All right, everybody. Wow. What an amazing introduction to an amazing author, G.K. Chesterton. Uh, Dale Elquist. Uh, man, I, I, I admire how much he knows about G.K. Chesterton. And, and he's definitely a figure you need to know. As, as that uh, the book, My Name is Lazarus, points out, he's incredibly influential in the, the, bringing people to the Catholic faith. So, you know, we should learn from him. Uh, anyway, coming up next, uh, we have the best of the Terry and Jesse show today. Unfortunately, it's not a live show. Uh, Jesse is out evangelizing, which, you know, who would have thought? <laughs> and also, Terry's feeling a little bit under the weather. So let's pray for both of them. And uh, uh, they'll be back tomorrow for Terry and Jesse show live. Also, tomorrow on Hands on Apologetics, we're going to have Dr. Stacy Tresecos. She's going to be coming on to talk about how. Her being a scientist that prepare a way for a conversion to the Catholic faith in her book, Particles of Faith. That's going to be cool. And Thursday, convert to the faith and scripture scholar, John Bergsma. Dr. John Bergsma joins us to talk a little bit about his conversion story and also focus on the book of Daniel and how Daniel's prophecies are fulfilled in Jesus the Messiah. It's a great week in store for us today. Thank you so much for listening and God bless. In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were opened to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever, especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat. And that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, 
you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. I know how listening to Catholic audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church, so I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio.